the face of a king who was born in a remote province of northern Greece, but whose name became renowned throughout the ancient world. The archaeologist who has brought this royal figure to light is Manolis Andronicus. For 50 years, he has worked in the tiny Macedonian village of Vergina, where he has rediscovered a civilization lost to history. And in 1977, Andronicus made world headlines with the most spectacular archaeological finds made in Europe this century, hidden within this huge earth burial mound. The magnificent objects he discovered were produced by a civilization who came to dominate the whole of ancient Greece. Their royal symbol was the starburst. In 1989, after 12 more years of excavation at the site, Andronicus peers into another tomb. Put together, the evidence he has uncovered has overturned one of the most fundamental tenets of classical history. That the glories of Greek culture were only to be found to the south, around the ancient city-states like Athens. Macedonia, far away to the north, had been ignored as backward and underdeveloped because there was little historical evidence about the nature of Macedonian society and so its sites remained buried and forgotten. Until in the 1850s, an adventurous French archaeologist, Léon Herzé, determined to travel beyond Mount Olympus. He journeyed north until he reached the tiny hamlet of Palatitsa, close to present-day Vergina. There he stumbled upon a ruined church, built from ancient stones and broken columns. What he found was intriguing, and investigating further around the church, he pieced together the outlines of a vast classical building. The ruins of Vergina clearly suggested that in the past, Macedonia had been more than merely a barbarian outpost. For what Jose had found was a royal palace, surrounded by a buried city. Ninety years later, Andronicus recognized the enormous significance of Jose's original observations. He realized the importance of the site. Uh, it's worth reading a quotation from his first book, who published in 1876. Uh, I read, Will those who rake over the same ground after us wish to investigate the confusing debris to look for the lines of constructions buried below the ground? We earnestly hope so, if indeed there is a chance to solve the mystery that envelops the history of Macedonia, we are convinced that it lies in the hills of Palatitia. Whatever the name of, it, of this unknown city, the importance of its ruins for Macedonia will be comparable to those of Pompeii. This quotation, this sentence is really prophetic because after a hundred and so years, now the results of the excavations uh, proved that this place was very, very important and we knew very many things about the history and the culture of Macedonians. The great importance of the site uncovered by Andronicus and the team he's brought together has transformed Vergina into a tourist attraction and Andronicus himself into a well-known public figure. 
κάνει και εγώ. But in the early years, just after the war, things were very different. Then he worked virtually alone and with slender resources in his attempt to understand more about the lost city. He felt the most intriguing feature of the site and the possible key to fulfilling Hersey's prophecy lay two kilometers from the palace, where there was a massive earth mound or tumulus. 110 meters long and 12 meters high, the sheer size of the mound made it unlike anything Andronicus had seen before. At first he was unable to predict what or who lay buried within it. From 1952 onwards he returned to the mound in several campaigns of excavation. And in 1962 he dug this massive trench in which he encountered the shattered fragments of gravestones which dated to the 3rd century BC. They'd been deliberately smashed, but why? Perhaps they were the remains left behind by ancient tomb robbers. In 1976, more fragments were uncovered when another trench was dug. But this time they could be explained, for historians had now agreed that Vergina was in fact the site of the first Macedonian capital called Aegea which they'd always thought lay further north at Edessa. A reference Andronicus knew from the writings of Plutarch made sense of the shattered gravestones, for it said that the royal cemetery at Aegea had been destroyed in the 3rd century BC. It was a revelation. Andronicus now believed that he was digging in the graveyard of the Macedonian kings. As he swung further around the mound in 1977, he began to anticipate the discovery of something quite remarkable. Digging in and down, the soil began to change colour, indicating a smaller mound that had been covered by the great tumulus. In it, they encountered blocks of dressed stone, and at last, after a 25-year search, the mound revealed its first tomb. But when the tomb was opened, they found that all its riches had been plundered, except one. Painted over 2,000 years ago, this mural depicts the abduction of Persephone by Pluto, god of the underworld. As the chariot thunders along, he heaves the panic-stricken goddess into his arms, while the four white horses are led hastily on by Hermes. Persephone, daughter of the corn goddess Demeter, was taken off by Pluto to the region where the souls of the dead resided. Seen in this burial context, the abduction is a symbol of the transition from life to death. The painting reflects a society which had a close acquaintance with Greek religion and the wealth to employ a great artist. Project artist Yorgos Miltsakakis spent a year working in the tomb to recreate the mural down to its finest brush strokes. And what he observed about the painter's style helped Andronicus to identify the artist as the legendary Nicomachus. We have information from uh, a Latin writer named Plinius about the style of Nicomachus, about the technique he used, I mean the colors and other details. And also we know that uh, Persephone's abduction was included to Nicomachus' repertoire. And uh, Professor Andronikos thinks that uh, Nicomachus must be responsible for this uh, painting. Adorned with classical art of such beauty, 
A tomb like this could only have been for Macedonian royalty. But could there be other tombs within the mound? By the winter of 1977, conditions for further work were getting harder. But Andronicus, still sensing he was close to a major discovery, pressed on. Finally, in the shadow of the huge wall of earth his excavation of the mound had created, another tomb was uncovered. Now protected behind closed doors and covered by a metal roof, stairs lead down some ten meters to Andronicus's greatest discovery. Tons of earth were cleared to reveal a monumental tomb with a facade over five meters high. Its Doric-style columns framed a door still sealed and intact. Above the door, a mural where youthful riders and athletic warriors hunt in a winter landscape. Behind the facade was a large vault, some ten meters long. Its arched construction, an advanced piece of architectural design. Whatever treasures it contained had been hidden from view for 23 centuries. Until on November the 8th, 1977, the keystone was lifted and Andronicus peered inside. On the floor of the tomb, exactly where they had first been placed, was an array of splendid objects. They represented the great power of the man whose remains lay in this marble sarcophagus. When its lid was lifted, Andronicus found inside a golden funeral casket known as a larnax. It opened to reveal cremated bones, stained purple by the decomposed cloth in which they'd been wrapped. Resting on top was a golden crown of finely wrought oak leaves. Among the other treasures that survive from the tomb are symbols of war, like this armor, fringed with gold and studded with lion's heads. And these gilded bronze leg guards or greaves. Objects like this ceremonial shield it took five years to reconstruct from all the tiny fragments which littered the floor of the tomb. Today, all the remaining pieces from the chamber are stored in the conservation lab at Vagina, awaiting reconstruction.
they have been spread out in their thousands, exactly as they were found in the tomb. They are even kept in layers, on top of each other, in the way they originally fell to the floor. Made of ivory, bronze, glass and gold, the fragments fit together, somehow, into the furnishings which adorned the tomb. Tiny golden figures from Greek mythology decorated the wooden funeral couch. Other lifelike figures with ivory heads were also attached to the couch. Could these be the dead man and his family? All the artifacts clearly showed that the tomb belonged to a powerful and wealthy warrior. But this symbol said something more, for it was the starburst emblem of the Macedonian kings. For Andronicus that meant one dramatic possibility. Might this be the tomb of Macedonia's great king, Philip II? Could the contents of the tomb provide any further clues? In the tomb we found uh, some ivory heads. Uh, among them was one uh, which uh, uh, I thought that was the portrait of Philip because the right eye of this ivory head was a blind eye and we knew that Philip was blind in his uh, right eye. But I had another uh, argument. The likeness with a gold medallion from Tassos, well known, uh, was very great. Philip II whom the Athenians reviled as the chief of a barbarian tribe until he came to dominate the whole of Greece. And whose son, Alexander the Great, set off to conquer the Persian Empire, spreading Macedonian power to the edges of the known world. Another clue was found on the mural, which shows a group of hunters, among whom are two distinguished riders. The whole painting has been recreated by Yorgos Mirzakakis. My opinion is that the central horseman, which is uh, between two, the two trees, uh, is Alexander the Great. And uh, when we found, I thought that this could be the, the dead. But as we understood that the dead was not a young man, but a mature man, uh, I realized that the dead was the other horseman, which is not very obvious now because of the damages, and uh, I distinguish in his face the face of Philip. The date of the artifacts found uh, in this tomb and out of this tomb were dated uh, in the third quarter of the fourth century, that means 300, uh, 350 to 325 BC. We knew that uh, during this period only one king was uh, dead and buried. Then, if the dead was correct, and to my opinion, and to, according to the opinion of all archaeologists, I think, uh, is correct, the only candidate was Philip. But it was the bones taken from the Larnax that provided the most graphic proof for the final identification. And this was made possible through the efforts of a British team of physical anthropologists who analyzed and reconstructed the face of the dead king. When we were examining the skull, the face and the jaws, uh, we observed first of all a neck out of the upper border of the right eye socket and we also observed asymmetries between the upper and lower jaws on right and left sides. 
which may indeed fit in with the injuries that Philip received 18 years before his death at the siege of Methone in 354, uh, when an arrow fired from the wall removed his right eye. Despite such terrible mutilation, Philip lived on to fight more foreign wars and expand his empire. Until here, just outside his palace, in the theater uncovered by Andronicus in 1982, he was murdered by an enemy from within. It was dawn on a day of celebration. The people of Igea pressed into the theater. But as Philip entered, he was struck down. His murderer was killed as he fled to his horses. Something we, uh, we know is uh, that after the, the death of Philip, uh, Alexander was proclaimed, probably here in this theater, King of Macedon. So from here starts the period of Hellenistic uh, civilization, let us say, the expedition of Alexander, uh, something which uh, changed the, the, the world, we can say. Alexander's reign began with bloody retribution. There was little solid evidence to implicate the dead assassin in a plot, but there were enough disaffected factions to attempt such a murder. Whether it was planned or not, the killer's sons were put to death, and Alexander executed two others he suspected of involvement. These unfortunates were thrown onto the funeral pyre alongside Philip and his regalia. As was the custom, the charred mud bricks from the base of the pyre were placed on top of the newly built tomb. A second chamber was added to the tomb after Philip's burial, revealed by this join in the plasterwork. Had it been built to receive another victim of Macedon's violent politics? When Andronicus entered it, he found even more riches. Inside were the remains of a woman's jewellery, like this gold-plated pectoral. There was more weaponry and armour. And lying among the decomposing remains on the floor, this crown of myrtle flowers. Inside the sarcophagus, he found a second golden larnax. It contained more bones, which were wrapped in a cloth of gold. Finally, there was another magnificent golden crown.
The identification of the bones from this Larnax presented Jonathan Musgrave with a difficult challenge, since they were so fragmented. The first priority was to prove conclusively the sex and age of the bones. He could then try to relate this information to the historical data about the characters involved in the political intrigues. When one's trying to establish the sex of any um, skeleton, one uses a few diagnostic, or as many diagnostic pieces as one can. Among the limb bones, for example, we have both right and both left femoral heads, and the size of those does differ quite significantly between the sexes, and those, of course, fall into the female range, and we have other bones like the head of the humerus and so on. We're talking about a young woman in her early to mid-twenties. The most likely is Cleopatra, who was Philip's last wife, who was murdered in early in 335, six months after Philip's death, along with her baby. Uh, she was uh, probably about 22 when she died, so she would be quite a strong candidate indeed. There is obviously the problem of the absence of baby bones, but that is not insuperable. She, was, she died under certainly hostile and tragic conditions, and her murderers or her enemies could very easily have you know, separated mother and child in death through vindictiveness. <laughs> To investigate the roots of the society which gave birth to Philip and Alexander, Andronicus extended his excavations to the plain on which the city and its cemetery sprawled for centuries. In the 1980s, one of Andronicus's assistants, Dr. Crisula Pagliadelli, undertook the huge task of uncovering the houses, streets, and public centers of Aegea. Despite discovering ruined walls and thousands of potsherds, it was difficult at first to understand the layout of the lost city. Then, in 1982, a temple was uncovered, built of finely cut marble. There were three statue bases, on one of which was an inscription saying that Eurydice, Philip's mother, had dedicated the temple to the goddess Euclea. This did more than just demonstrate royal patronage of the religious life of the city. It also told Pagliadelli that the area close to the temple could be the agora, or public heart of the city, if the Macedonians had followed Greek convention. The evidence of these ruined walls now indicates that this was so. The very plan of the city is a sign of how much Igea reflected Greek culture a generation before Philip. But Andronicus has found even earlier evidence a little way to the north. Here, a whole cemetery of tumuli dates back to the earliest presence of the Macedonians at Vergina. I had started my excavations uh, in '52, uh, and I excavated a cemetery of small tumuli. This uh, is dated from 10th century BC to 7th century. Andronicus found that some of the mounds contained multiple burials, which showed that successive generations had reused them to bury their families. The dead were accompanied by bronze objects, which, as early as 1000 BC, already showed clear connections with southern Greek styles.
we had the history of this place from the early Iron Age, from 10th century, up to the Roman period, but we, we needed the two centuries, the 6th and the 5th, which were very important for the history of the Macedonians, because we were just the early dates of the Macedonian kingdom. Uh, and uh, as we know now that this place was the first capital of Macedon, to have uh, any evidence of this early period is very important. And in 1988, between the mounds and the city, Andronicus found his long-awaited missing link in a spectacular tomb dating from the early 5th century BC. It was the grave of a woman. Her skeleton has decomposed, but the head and body can be discerned in the pattern her exquisite jewellery has made around her. Her head is crowned by a headband and draped with a golden coil. And all around are pins, brooches and other ornaments. Dr. Angeliki Kotaridou was responsible for its excavation. These pieces of jewellery were found at Agea, now the modern village of Vergina. The grave dates from 500 to 490 BC, and the beautiful jewellery makes it clear that it belonged to a woman. She was buried with magnificent clothes decorated with gold. She wore a heavy robe over a lighter dress. The rope was fastened with these two brooches and the dress would be held in place with the help of this fibula. The grave also contained many other pieces of jewellery. This is the woman's necklace. And this is a bracelet with a detail showing a snake's head. Um, Finally, we found this set of beautiful golden earrings. In 1989, Andronicus investigated the area adjacent to the Golden Grave in the hope of finding more intact burials. Four tombs were found in this newly discovered cemetery. Two were built of limestone blocks to make underground chambers. The others were simpler shaft graves dug straight into the earth. But there were also the frustrating signs that tomb robbers had been there before them. Digging the largest of the two chamber tombs, Andronicus's fears were confirmed. Bones and artifacts were strewn all around, leaving a scatter of pottery and marble vessels, and a skull thrown to one side. Nevertheless, Andronicus found some very important evidence. Called white lekithoi, these vases were previously assumed to have been possessed only by elite Athenians. Imported around 450 BC, their appearance here proves that a century before Philip, Macedonian nobility displayed a wealth and sophistication comparable to their southern counterparts. <laughs> Dionysius Capizionis is an expert conservator. He has come to Vagina to undertake the restoration of the vases. The main problem he faces is the hardness of the mineral deposits, which will require many hours of careful cleaning to remove.
In one of the shaft graves, and in this second chamber tomb, the robbers had been very thorough. But even here, in this small pit, the team encountered more golden relics. Though the robbed shaft tomb had been disappointing, they still found one of a pair of golden shoes. As the excavation progressed, attention turned to the fourth burial. A deeper shaft grave, earlier than the chamber tombs. And this time, the indications were more promising. And now we are searching a big trench, very deep. We are reaching now the fourth meters deep, and we hope that uh, will be a quite uh, important burial of the late 6th or early 5th century. Uh, until now, we had a find above the burial, probably was in the filling of the, of the shaft. We found almost, if I'm correct, uh, 10 or 11 terracotta heads. Uh, in natural size, broken, but very beautiful work. Uh, I could say it's a, a great sculpture. Probably were done in a mold, and uh, all of them uh, were the same, the same face, I mean, the same personality. Probably is a goddess, and probably is the goddess Persephone, as far as I can judge from the first uh, moment. With this find, Andronicus once more encountered the goddess whose image he'd seen in the first tomb found in the great tumulus 12 years before. By the end of the 1989 season, he had added well over 20 heads to this collection. Beautifully made, they still bear traces of their original colouring. There are so many that Andronicus now believes that they may represent a cult of Persephone, perhaps similar to those celebrated in southern Greece, and here indicating an important grave. There is an evidence that underneath we'll find something very important, but still we don't know. In archaeology, you never uh, can say that you'll find or you'll find not. Sometimes. Uh, you have no hopes and you find something very important. Sometimes you are almost sure and you don't find anything. At the base of the shaft, there is a bronze tripod used to support a vessel. And close by, another bowl. But still, no sign of a burial. There is also a strange layer of charcoal. Again, Andronicus and his team are confronted by unique and puzzling features. Suddenly, the charcoal is interrupted by this area of rubble fill, which extends into the neighbouring chamber tomb. They had found a tunnel used to gain access to the shaft grave by those who had already robbed the chamber tomb. In dragging their booty back through the tunnel, the robbers seemed not to care that they dropped articles like this bronze figurine. If this was not worth taking, what else might the tomb have contained? All this makes us to think that it was a very rich and very important tomb. And uh, I must remark that uh, uh, it's something, uh, uh, it brings to my mind an idea that all the tombs we found until now in this area are female tombs, are uh, bales of uh, ladies, very rich ladies, uh, and of uh, different dates. Uh, it's uh, rather unusual. Andronicus now knows that this female cemetery continued in use and became grander and grander. 
And most important, the dig has finally connected the early growth of Macedonia with its golden age. Because there is one more female tomb, hidden under this tin roof, that reveals a direct link to King Philip. This is the first time cameras have been allowed inside. Another monumental tomb like Philip's, but even larger. The door to the main chamber tantalizingly ajar. When the tomb was first discovered in 1987, Andronicus found that several huge blocks had been removed by robbers trying to enter the tomb from the side. He also found a human skeleton. And a second body was lying in the antechamber. Both, it seems, were murdered by companions intent on taking all the treasures inside for themselves. After a lifetime of searching for unrobbed tombs, Andronicus had come across some of the culprits who had deprived him for so long. The issue now was, had this falling out among thieves diverted them from their purpose? Could anything remain intact inside the tomb? absolutely unique uh, uh, characteristics. First is the marvelous throne. It's unique, absolutely unique, with this painting, which is, again, the only one painting on a marble piece like this we have, uh, all this sculpture decoration, all this relief gilt decoration. It's absolutely marvelous. Then we have the back wall of this chamber, which represents the facade of a of a tomb of a building. It's an ionic building with the columns, the epistelion, and all the other elements of an ionic art. But here we have the whole colours. It's the only one building of antiquity I know with all uh, its colours. We have uh, this false door, these false windows, and we have something more. On the vault, we have iron hooks. I don't know the use of them. That the tomb belongs to a lady is uh, almost sure. Uh, this tomb is the biggest and the earliest of all Macedonian tombs. Uh, the throne is something very uh, exceptional. All the construction makes me believe that uh, it's a royal tomb again. The only lady of the royal family which uh, lived or died about 340 when we date the tomb with certainty, almost certainty, is Philip's mother Eurydice. And we know from uh, the place, I mean from uh, Vergina, at least two inscriptions with the name of Eurydice. So I call it, under brackets of course, until now, to, uh, Eurydice's tomb.
In the final years before Eurydice died, before her son, King Philip, had reached the height of his power, the philosopher Aristotle walked among the streets, temples, and courtyards of the Macedonian capital at Egea. And he would have been at home here, among a people who had developed independently over the centuries, but who participated as equals in the classical culture of all Greece. More than 2,000 years later, it is Manolis Andronicus who has revealed the true glories of Macedonian civilization. Andronicus is now in his 70s. It has already been a lifetime's work, patiently piecing together the evidence from the soil of Vagina. But ahead of him lie many more years of research, as the ancient city continues to yield up its secrets. We found uh, just two pieces of a new wall of sun-dry bricks, uh, which probably is the corner of another tomb. It's nearby, but uh, we have no time to excavate this tomb, so I, I decided to leave it for next year's excavation, so to have where to start ne next year. So the archaeology gives us the only is the only source of information for uh, the Macedonian history. And for the early history, it's very important uh, because we can understand the, the standard of uh, culture, of civilization of these Macedonians. And uh, as you know, the Athenians sometimes called them barbarians. But now we find so exquisite uh, objects and uh, we understand that uh, can be a, a barbaric people. The Macedonians were consummate artists, but also great warriors and empire builders. It was they, through the conquests of Alexander the Great, who spread classical Greek culture across the ancient world. A culture which lies at the heart of Western civilization. <laughs> 